Bible is full of stories that we all know and love. But how well do we know them? The answer might surprise you. The Bible you thought you knew is going to dive deep into the exquisite details of the biblical stories that make them fascinating and transforming. Happy New Year! In last week's podcast, actually in two weeks ago, we dealt with the genealogy of Jesus as it appears in the Gospel of Matthew. This week, we will deal with the genealogy of Jesus as it appears in the Gospel of Luke. There are substantial differences in these two lists. Two differences are readily apparent. One, in Luke's genealogy, the list starts with Jesus and works backwards, the very opposite of the direction followed in Matthew's genealogy. Two, no women are ever mentioned. This contrasts with the five women listed in Matthew's genealogy, three of whom were obviously non-Israelite, and one who may have been. Bathsheba's connections are never mentioned in 2 Samuel, though her husband Uriah was famously a Hittite. Mary, Jesus' mother, was of course Jewish. One other, other differences also obtain, which we will mention as we work through this genealogical list. First, we need to point out that Jesus' genealogy in Luke comes after, rather than before, the nativity events. In Luke's gospel, Jesus has already been baptized when the genealogy is presented, and it is presented in chapter 3, verses 23 through 38. Indeed, the notation preceding the genealogical list says that Jesus began his ministry at age 30. In a sense, in Luke's Jesus, in Luke, Jesus' genealogy is more closely connected to his adult mis- ministry than to the circumstances of his birth. And it again starts at verse 23 of chapter 3. Right off the bat, at the very start of the genealogy, we encounter a disagreement with Matthew's genealogy. Joseph, of course, is listed as Jesus' father. The parenthetical parenthetical phrase, quote-unquote, as was supposed, was decidedly an allusion to the fact that Joseph was not biologically related to his son, since in this gospel, as well, Mary is presented as a virgin. However, Joseph's father is named Heli, not Jacob, as in Matthew's version. Heli begins a long list of names in this genealogy that are otherwise not known. That's in verse 23 again. Though attempts are made, the two genealogies are impossible to harmonize. They reflect different traditions and have different purposes. These differences are emphatic when one comes to David. In Luke's case, David is not referred to as Israel's king. See verse 31. He is simply one of the long list of Jesus' ancestors. Even more interested, Solomon is not part of this list. Instead, David's son Nathan makes the list. Virtually nothing is known about Nathan from the Old Testament. On the contrary, Solomon is one of the Old Testament's most famous characters. Why Nathan in this instance? Easy answers to that question are not forthcoming. After David, this genealogy continues to work backwards, but it does not end with Abraham. Keep in mind that Matthew's genealogy began with Abraham. But in Luke's version, the genealogy goes back to the characters found in Genesis 1-11, through a time before God decided to elect Abraham and Sarah as the original ancestors that would eventuate into the people of Israel. So, Luke cites Terach, Abraham's father, as this descending order goes on. Mentioning Nahor, Terach, Abraham's father, the list mentions in order a number of people who belong to what has typically been considered the primeval era. 
This listing includes people like Shem, Noah, Lamech, Methuselah, Enoch, Jared, Mahalalel, Kynan, Enos, Seth, and finally Adam. Adam. It is interesting that only Shem, Noah's son, is named, but Ham and Japheth are left out. We can understand why Seth, Adam's son, is mentioned, but not Cain, because Cain and his descendants did not survive the great flood. But Shem, Ham, and Japheth were responsible for the whole world's population, according to Genesis 10. Yet only Shem among Noah's sons made the cut. Again, the reasons for inclusion inclusion, and exclusion are not readily ascertainable. Another interesting feature has to do with the fact that Adam is the last person in the list. One might have expected that here, at least, one woman would have been mentioned, namely Eve. Remember that when Adam named her, he remarked that she was the mother of all living. That's in verse 20 of chapter 3 of Genesis. Regardless, Eve is not named. Instead, when the last man, or the first man, depending on the perspective one takes, is named, it is Adam, who is then called the Son of God. That is an interesting title for Adam, to say the least. Being designated a son of God in the Old Testament is typically reserved for kings. Adam was no king. But he did did represent the beginning of humanity, a humanity that was fashioned by the deity. In that sense, he and all those who followed him were sons of God, or for that matter, also daughters of God. But eventually, being called a son of God, or a daughter of God, took on a new meaning. It should not escape our attention that just before this genealogy is presented in Luke, the last incident mentioned is Jesus' baptism in verses 21 through 22 of chapter 3. When the baptism occurs, Jesus is praying. At that point, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove. Then a voice was heard from heaven. That voice said, You are my Son, the Beloved One. With you I am very pleased. Right after that, we encounter the genealogy in descending order from Jesus back to Adam, the original Son of God. Obviously, as a human being, Jesus, like Adam, traced his origins to God. However, at the baptism, this sonship has taken on a completely different dimension. A few remarks about this genealogy are in order. One, it is impossible to harmonize this one with the one in Matthew. This, that suggests that both genealogies have significant theological import that transcends accurate biological information. Since in both nativity accounts, Jesus' mother is a virgin, one might have expected genealogies of Mary. If Jesus was not related to Joseph biologically, why rehearse in such length Joseph's genealogy? Clearly, theological and religious symbolism are in play in both genealogies. Two, Though in Luke's genealogy, Jesus is completely Israelite or Jewish, by tracing his line back to a place before Abraham and Sarah were called, makes him related to all humanity in a special way. The God who made Adam the original son of God in one sense would have no difficulty in making Jesus a son of God in another sense. Three, Luke universalizes Jesus somewhat differently from the manner in which Matthew did the same thing. In Matthew's gospel, we have a group of outsider women who are part of Jesus' genealogy, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Uriah's wife. These women all had crucial roles. Indeed, were it not for Tamar's taking the dangerous step of deceiving her father-in-law, 
Judah would not have had uh, any future at all. Keep in mind that Judah's wife, a Canaanite, had died, and his first two sons had died. He still had one other son, but that son had to remain in a kind of marital limbo until he performed his duty as a brother-in-law of impregnating Tamar. But Judah had no intention of letting this third son get anywhere close to this woman. Plus, he had no regard for his future, which is why he was willing to sleep with a woman he believed was a prostitute. Therefore, had Tamar given up, Judah would not have had sons, and David would never have seen the light of day. These women were absolutely crucial to Israel's story. In any case, Luke's genealogy, like Matthew's, scores significant theological points that are essential to their respective Gospels. Their value is not based on biological accuracy, but on what they say about the transforming story of Jesus writ large. Let me encourage you to go to my website, faspina.com, and... um, let me know what your email is. Soon you'll be getting an announcement our, about our first mini courses, and I will have a list of those mini courses soon posted onto my website. If you have a question you would like me to answer, email me at fspina106 at gmail.com. I want to thank you so very much for listening to The Bible You Thought You Knew. I have a question for you. Do you have a question or topic that you'd like me to cover on the podcast? If so, all you need to do is head over to Apple Podcasts and do two simple things. One, leave a rating and review telling me what you think of the podcast. Two, in that review, ask anything you want related to the Bible. That's all you have to do. Then, listen in to hear your question answered on a future episode. Join us next time on The Bible You Thought You Knew when we discuss Jesus' personal Bible. God bless.